Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This episode, we'll be talking, well, an MLS review, the spursiest of spurs, uh, coaches' hot seat, pizza, Ken Burns, salary cap, soccer hail, soccer hair, not hail, soccer hair, failures, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how you doing on this Monday, May 1st in the year 2023? I am doing very well. Excited to be here to recap an action-packed weekend. You look good. All sorts of stuff going on. Before we get to that, uh, did you watch anything or read anything or do anything particularly noteworthy this weekend? I was in the presence of a man who over the years has contributed to this What Are We Watching segment. Really? I went to a Ken Burns lecture at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. He talked about all his different documentaries. He talked about how he chooses his subjects, the process of making them, and he spoke very eloquently about the importance of understanding history. It was terrific. Yeah? yeah. Anything controversial? Did you get into anything? Anything political or anything uh, memorable when it comes to the stuff that you say? Anything inflammatory? Not really, but uh, he did reveal a couple of uh, documentaries he has coming up, which I'm very excited for. Uh, one on the American Revolution. Okay. And another on Leonardo da Vinci. Ooh, I like it. Uh, I mean, look, he does a, a wonderful... Do you have a favorite over uh, the, the canon there? Uh, I think the Civil War one is considered yeah. his masterpiece. I did love the Vietnam War one as well. I mean, he, he's so good in that, in that genre that... You know the way he does it has become a, a, an art in and of itself, and and duplicated and replicated uh, at different times. So wonderful! All right, cool. I think he's I think he's coming to the South Bay where I live down there too. Uh, to I guess it would be to perform, even though you're just giving a a, a talk. Mind you, I was the youngest person there by like 20 years. <laughs> uh, my peers were all home making TikTok videos. Oh my goodness. Oh, I love it. Uh, I did not watch anything in particular uh, noteworthy. And I, 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 maybe we're just getting to the bottom of the barrel when it comes to a lot of these streaming services for me. Uh, yeah, so I, I could uh, I could throw out a movie or two that I that I watched, but they weren't they weren't no, noteworthy or anything like that. But what I wanted to use this time to talk about is you know we we talk about all the people out there that uh, that follow and uh, and listen and download and watch. Uh, the, the State of the Union podcast, and we're so blessed to have so many uh, folks out there. And each and every day, more and more people come to it, and it's wonderful. Um, do you know the rally mullet over there on uh, Twitter? I do, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for those that uh, that don't know, it's a, he's, a, he's a wonderful follow, really into uh, to soccer, and a big fan of uh, of the show. So much so that he wanted to get in touch, and he did get in touch with me, uh, to send us some swag. Now, for those uh, also that don't know, you know, that's his, his, uh, his name on Twitter, the Rally Mullet. But uh, in real life, um, you know, he is part of a, uh, an establishment over there in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, he runs Coretti's Pizza, him and his family, I guess. And he sent uh, something, and he sent it on, if you can uh, check this out here, on a guest check here. So, uh, hello, Alexi and David. Greetings from Seaburg, Pennsylvania. Love listening to the pod. It's my go-to soccer pod. A little bit about my pizza shop. We have a 28-inch pizza called the Hercules Pizza, and we have a sub called the Bomb. We won Best Pizza Award twice in the county. Check out our menu to see other stuff that you might like. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, Thank you, Bruno. First off, for sending us the stuff. By the way, this is uh, this is the Coretti's Pizza menu here, and they have all sorts of good stuff. And they're not sponsoring anything, but you know, he took the time to send us not only this stuff and a wonderful note, and let us know that he loves the uh, the pod, but also some swag here from Coretti's Pizza here. So you take that. I'm going to take this this blue one here. Thank you, thank you, Bruno. Thank you so much. And look, if you are ever in. Schaumburgsburg, Pennsylvania, and who knows, I might be there, you might be there at a certain point, absolutely look up Coretti's Pizza and check it out because they support the show, and we like to support people that uh, that support the show. So thank you for uh, for doing that. All right, all right, ready, my friend? Ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right, where should we start off here? Let's start off in some MLS stuff, right? 
Yep, we had a showdown between the top two teams in the East, New England versus Cincinnati. It ended 1-1, Mosqueda and Boateng with the goal. Some bad news for the Revs. Dylan Borero picked up what looked to be a serious knee injury. Yeah, that is that is a big loss in terms of stretching the game. And, you know, this is a New England team that had been on a run. So, you know, while they, while they certainly got a point out of it, Cincinnati continues to just grind out results. But in the long term... That loss for New England uh, in terms of, of personnel, that is huge because your ability to put a, a team on the back foot and have players run behind and exploit that space obviously is a tactic, but it's, but it's incredibly dangerous. And when you lose that, you become more predictable and you have less options, obviously. So we'll keep an eye on, uh, on that. What else stood out to you there? Well, just on Borero, he's a player that uh, played in Brazil with Atletico Mineiro, kind of got lost in the shuffle there, a very deep squad, and it really found a nice home, MLS, New England. So he's a talented player, disappointing. Hopefully it's not that serious. It, I mean, it didn't look great, and he, yeah. and he came off on a stretcher, and obviously everybody you know, will talk about um, on, on the turf and all that kind of stuff, and it, you know, it's not a great environment there uh, in New England. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Nashville. Should we check that one out? Yep, uh, Nashville with a 3-1 home win over Atlanta. This was the Big Fox game. Uh, Pico, uh, t Bum Bumbury, and Schaffelberg with the goals. Uh, Hani Mukhtar with two assists. Tiago Almada found the back of it from the penalty spot. A nice result for Nashville. Huh? Big result for Nashville. They still lack a, a true guy up top, but Hani Mukhtar is worth the price of admission. And every single time he gets the ball – one, he creates good stuff, but two, it's really difficult to take the ball off him. And so it, while it might not always lead to a, a chance or something like that, the confidence that, that you have for a guy that is often in advanced positions against multiple players, not to lose the ball, to get out of tight situations, to try to create something out of nothing. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful to see. And, you know, we just talked a little bit about injuries. Nashville, like any team that relies on a player, they can ill afford to lose him going forward, but they still are missing something. And, you know, they did what they, they needed to do here. And as the space opened up and as Atlanta opened up, which is still not Atlanta is still not clicking on all cylinders, uh, both in terms of the way that they play. And I also think uh, in the personnel, but, you know, a good result for, uh, for Nashville, uh, that, that stadium and that environment always looks cool and they, uh, and they bring it and they were rewarded the, uh, the faithful there. Uh, Giacomakis did not play because of that hamstring injury, uh, but if he starts his next game, he could still equal that Taylor Twelman record we talked about. Uh, Twelman, the only player to score in his first six career MLS starts. Giacomakis is on five. I mean, <laughs> long live the Greeks. <laughs> We're going to talk more uh, about some Greeks later on in the show, by the way. That's right, yeah. Nice, uh, nice tease. Do you see that? Do you see the way I do that? Um, and then the FS1 game. But hold on, before we go to that, can we just can we just hit a couple more things here that, that are just popping out uh, popping out to me. Uh, Inter Miami going to Columbus and getting a uh, and getting a win. And it's not just a win, but it is uh, a win in a week in a week that they scraped out the Open Cup and then they were able to go on the road. And Mr. Neville down there is under, and I, I think, and rightfully so, an incredible amount of pressure right now. This was huge, especially when I mean, we've talked about it now for a number of weeks, how good Columbus is. And to go into Columbus and to find a, uh, a win, hats off to them. Uh, also, hats off to Wayne Rooney and company. Um, I think they're on a streak of four wins in a row if you had all, uh, all competitions right now. And... You know, that Benteke stuff, it's, it's, it's working right now for D.C. United. And let's be honest, it's been a long time <laughs> since we've been able to say that something is working when it comes to D.C. United. And, and then the final one that I'll, that, I'll, uh, that I'll mention before we get to that, that Sunday game, um, the L.A. Galaxy lost again. And the L.A. Galaxy losing even to Orlando City is a big deal. And I know without Pouche, uh, this is a very different team, but still – Talk about uh, the hot seat. Greg Vanny, absolutely on the hot seat, and certainly um, we'll talk about uh, some more player, uh, more, more coaches on the hot seat as we go on, not the least of which is Peter Vermes out there in uh, at Sporting KC. We have an Ask Alexi question yeah. about him, so we'll, we'll hit on him there. Um, the FS1 game, Western Conference showdown, Minnesota-Dallas finished 0-0. A lot of stories about Minnesota shopping for some attacking help, and you can see why. They need more firepower up front. 
Yeah, they need more firepower. And did you see this quote, by the way, from Adrian Heath on Reynoso? I mean, Reynoso has been part of the whole story for the loons this year. He said, we've had people down there. Obviously, it, it was disappointing. We thought he was going to be back, but he didn't. We'll keep asking the question, and hopefully some sort of common sense will prevail. <laughs> and he gets on a plane and gets back here. Now, th this whole drama and saga with Reynoso as to what actually is going on, and we know he's just evidently refused to come back for whatever reason, and it could be, you know, personal types of things that are going on there. They're not, they're not paying him, but they need to do something, and they have eked along. And actually, t to Heath's credit, they've done a really good job, as, uh, as we said but right now. But the, the way it's being framed right now, because we have so little information, it's almost like this this covert CIA operation going on to extricate him from a situation, this mission to get him out, which obviously is, is not producing any, any results. And that's, that's bad for Adrian Heath and company right now. And come this summer, they gotta, they gotta figure out uh, something going forward because they're just kicking the can down, uh, down the line here. And, you know, ultimately this was, this was a boring game. This was there was not much going on in the, in this game, and that it ended zero zero. I, okay, I, I guess, but I, I know I'm I'm fascinated by what the real story is when it comes to Reynolds. Well, hopefully, common sense prevails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm sure it will. Anything else stand uh, stand out to you when it comes to uh, MLS this weekend? St. Louis lost again. Uh, Portland went into St. Louis and uh, and beat them. Uh, other than that, not a not a whole lot going on. Montreal, and we'll talk about Kansas City later on, went into uh, Sporting KC and won, but evidently that's nothing new when you're playing against Kansas City. Uh, neither LAFC or Philadelphia played this yep. weekend, but those two will collide Tuesday night, FS1, the second leg of the CONCACAF Champions League semis. The first leg at Subaru Park finished 1-1. Gazdag from the penalty spot, and then Kellen Acosta, whose handball had... Uh, resulted in the penalty. He redeems himself by scoring a late equalizer. Uh, the away goals rule is in effect. So in this return leg in Los Angeles, nil nil LAFC go through. 1-1 one, one we go to penalties. 2-2 two, two or higher, Philly take it. So as you mentioned, uh, even before the whistle blows, if it all ended up like this, LAFC would go through on away goals uh, right. being 0-0. Uh, being zero, zero. I don't see that game being 0-0. Zero, zero. I see goals being scored. Um, are you still on board with? Because uh, things can change over the, you know, even over days. Are you still on board with LAFC closing this one out? Yes, and even more so if Jose Martinez is out. He picked up an injury late in the first leg. I'm not sure what his status is for uh, this Tuesday night's game, but that would be a big miss for the Union. Yeah, I think that LAFC will have their number, and I mean, I, I hate betting against. Philly and and Jim Curtin, but yeah, I'm gonna go with LAFC, and then uh, you're you're still sticking with uh, Tigris as am I to close it out. Yeah, although I'm waffling a little. Oh, you're waffling. I, f I I I feel a waffle. Yeah, I see so, a waffle. So Wednesday night, it's the second leg of the All Mexican matchup. Leon hosting Tigres. Leon looking to overturn a 2-1 first leg deficit. These two teams played this past weekend in the final round of the Liga MX regular season. Leon won 3-0, so they would obviously love a similar result. We'll see if they can get it. And, and you know, and part of the reason, at least why I enjoy watching this tournament, is the, the competition with others. And let's be honest, it, it's not specific, but for the most part it ends up being MLS versus Liga MX. And we know all of the, the you know, the partnerships and the connections that are going on and they continue to go on. But, you know, it's, it's also about credibility and it's also about bragging rights. And for so long, you know, many that don't like MLS, that don't like American soccer in general, will point to the fact uh, until last year that in the modern version of this uh, tournament, an MLS team has never even been champions of CONCACAF and how do you expect to be the best league in the world if that's your aspiration if you can't even be the best or, uh, within your uh, your region now Seattle changed that to a certain extent but you don't want it to be an anomaly you don't want it to just be a one-off type of thing and whether it's LAFC or, or, or Philly they're going to have their hands full in this final and League MX doesn't want to wants to make sure that people realize that this was an anomaly last year and that's why I love it 
in terms of the bragging rights, and it's one less thing that people can use against Major League Soccer, and it's one more check mark that MLS can use in terms of that debate and that constant discussion relative to uh, quality and relative to competitiveness and ultimately relative to uh, credibility. Two in a row would signify a changing of the guard, much like the Michigan-Ohio State football <laughs> rivalry. <laughs> Incidentally, on League MX, uh, Leon finished sixth, Tigres finished seventh, uh, so they are both headed to the repechaje. Uh, Leon will face Atlético San Luis, uh, Tigres will face Puebla. You just wanted to say that. You just let Joey say that. It's like all your French words. All right. Anything else uh, there? A lot of stuff to look forward to when it comes to CCL this week. Uh, and, you know, another, I think, successful and interesting and entertaining weekend of MLS uh, soccer, even though it's it kind of squeezed into that Saturday, although we did have some Sunday uh, MLS soccer, which was, uh, which was nice. Anything else? That's it. All right. Let's take another quick break. Or our first quick break, and when we come back, we'll take a look around uh, Europe because there were some interesting things that happened. Don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back. Uh, all right, Mossy, let's take a trip around Europe. There were some uh, interesting doings happening over there in uh, jolly old England. We begin with Leeds. They suffered a 4-1 defeat away to Bournemouth. They are going to finish this round in 17th because Leicester play Everton today, and one of those teams will surpass them. Uh, Tyler Adams still out injured. They miss him dearly. Brendan Aronson was an unused sub this past weekend. Wesson McKinney started but was subbed out. More on him in a minute. Uh, to add insult to injury, a video has surfaced of the Leeds players ignoring their fans at the team hotel. And breaking news this morning, it looks like they are set to fire Javi Gracia, the manager who they brought in to replace Jesse Marsh. Does this, does this vindicate Jesse Marsh to a certain extent? Or it really doesn't matter who you put in it. It's just not a team that is equipped to compete, especially when you lose players like Tyler Adams. Um, he wasn't lighting the world on fire either, but they have clearly gotten worse under Gracia. So to some degree, yeah, I do think it vindicates Marsh. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think it, it certainly helps in terms of, I don't know if his image needed to be re rehabilitated. I mean, he, he failed, and we'll talk about failure later on in the, in the uh, show, too. Now, uh, relative to the, the video that came out of the Leeds players coming off of the bus, I, part of me says, you know, this isn't quite fair. And if every high-profile athlete had to stop and or acknowledge every single person along the way that recognized him or her, <laughs> they would be doing little else. Now, having said that, the, uh, you know, the headphones and the look down, and I, I, I get being in the zone and preparing. I, I totally understand that, but here's the deal. It's 2023, all right? And it shouldn't matter that it's 2023, but you'll realize why I say it's 2023 in a second here. Don't be a dick, okay? Just in general, don't be a dick. And it's 2023. So even if you are a dick, recognize that everything that you do is going to be on video, whether it's on the field or off the field, and certainly in a public setting like that. You have to respect and recognize that there are going to be people with camera phones everywhere that you go. And so everything that you do can be interpreted, and yes, misinterpreted on a continual basis. Is it fair? Uh, welcome to life. Life isn't fair. You live in 2023 where everybody has a camera and everything is documented. And you are in a high-profile position, by the way, which pays you ridiculous amounts of money to kick a ball around in while wearing shorts. The very least you can do is give a thumbs up, give a hello. And some of the players, uh, to be fair to uh, Leeds, did. But especially when it involves kids and you're walking by, it's a bad look. And you might not mean anything by it, but I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It's a bad look, and it can be turned into a negative very very easily easily and you can scream and yell and say oh i didn't see him or oh i was really focused on the game and all that it it, do, it doesn't matter and you know they've come out and given a you know a public not necessarily apology but an explanation as to what happening and they love their fans and the result that they had was crap and and all that kind of stuff but you know i i i get it 
when you are insulated and isolated in the way that many professional athletes are, and it's not just a, this isn't me grumpy old manning this, because this is, this is something that's been around for a while. You can lose track of reality. You can obviously not appreciate or respect all that you are given and all that you have. And if and when that happens, you should be called out on your shit whether you mean to do it or not and let that be a lesson to all of these uh, all of these players and does it mean that you're you're doing it and you're disingenuous that's why it goes back to you could be a jerk and if you're a jerk fine but still do it because it doesn't look good and it's a small little thing but it matters and i think that's the least that we should expect from a professional athlete in a public setting like that on Wes and McKinney I don't want to turn this into a thing where every week we take a different U.S. player and create a crisis around him but (laughs) uh, this move has not worked out this guy was playing regularly at Juventus Mm -hmm. and he's now slumming it in a relegation battle he's been really poor especially since Tyler Adams got injured and he's had to play a different role and Leeds fans are all over him on social media and suddenly Wesson McKinney's future this summer seems to be up in the air. Well, I mean, he's still property of Juventus, and so the the loan, I think, right now, and regardless of what happens over the next, I think, six games or whatever, w- I think will have been looked at as, we get back to this, a failure, right? <laughs> <laughs> and again, we'll talk about this later. But uh, it was it has not been successful, and there could be a number of different uh, different reasons. But now Juventus has to decide what they are ultimately going to do. And the criticism that Weston McKinney has come in for, I think, is completely fair and completely warranted. Yes, he's, he's not playing on Juventus. He's not playing on one of the elite teams. He's not playing uh, on a team where – he went from a team where he was just part of the machine to being the prime – part of the machine and being expected to be, I think, more than either he wanted or can be in this moment, given what given what Leeds is. It leads their last four games away to Manchester City, home to Newcastle, away to West Ham, home to Tottenham. So not easy. Good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> staying with the American theme, uh, Fulham suffered a 2-1 home defeat to Manchester City. Both Ream and Robinson started this match. Ream unfortunately picked up an injury in the first half. Uh, it looks like he's going to miss the remainder of the season and now likely the uh, CONCACAF Nations League as well. Sucks. I mean, uh, Tim Ream, I think you could argue of Americans that are playing out there, arguably the most consistent and the highest level, and this is for a guy in his th- in his 30s. And so it sucks for him. It sucks for Fulham. Um, you know, I don't know how serious ultimately this ar- this fracture in his right arm is going to be, but he's not going to feature, I don't think, for the rest of the, uh, the season, which is – Okay. Uh, yeah, it sucks from a competitive standpoint, but he needs to get better. The arm will heal. I don't know how this relates to his uh, national team possibilities through the summer uh, and those duties that, are, that he's going to have. But, you know, at this point, and I don't know if this is a good or bad thing, but Tim Ream is arguably the best defender that we have and playing at an incredibly high level. So I feel, I feel bad for Tim Ream, but he's a strong dude. And uh, if you're going to break something as a soccer player, have a beer on. Uh, the flip side of that result at Craven Cottage is, of course, the title race. Uh, City leapfrog Arsenal. They're now one point ahead and have a game in hand. Arsenal back in action Tuesday against Chelsea. The City goals in that game. Erlen Holland from the penalty spot. And then Julian Alvarez with a sensational strike. The Holland goal, his 50th 50. in all competitions yeah. this season. 34th in the Premier League. He's already set a new record in a 38-game season, and now he's equaled Alan Shearer and Andy Cole's overall record, which those guys achieved in a 42-game season, and presumably he'll break that as well. It's amazing. It, it, it's amazing. And they didn't they didn't really get out of second or third gear uh, when it comes to Man City, and still got the result that they they needed. And and Fulham, Fulham to their credit, you know they they kept pouring it on. They got their goal. They got some other opportunities there. So, but you know that's the mark of a champion is going away, yes, against inferior opposition, getting the goals that they needed, not really causing problems and not really expending crazy amounts of energy because they'll be fighting on multiple fronts now 
uh, continuing forward. And they certainly have incredible talent and depth to be able to do that. I mean, De Bruyne didn't, uh, didn't play, and that's, that's how good they are. The crazy game in the Premier League this weekend took place at Anfield. Liverpool hosted Tottenham. Liverpool jumped out to a 3-0 lead. Tottenham came all the way back, made it 3-3 in stoppage time, thought they were going to get a point, but then uh, Liverpool scored again. Diogo Jota the hero, so they'll take it 4-3. I do want to ask you about Tottenham. Uh, they had a game recently away to Newcastle in which they conceded five goals in the uh, first 21 minutes en route to a 6-1 defeat, and it was so embarrassing that they uh, refunded the traveling Tottenham fans who attended that game. And then lo and behold, this past weekend, they're down 3-0 in the first 15 minutes. My Twitter timeline was 500 different variations of the sure. same joke. We'll get that refund ready again. In this case, they stormed back and made a game of it, so it became a moot point. But behind this joke, there, there is an interesting conversation to be had. Everybody applauded that gesture of refunding the fans, but have they set a weird precedent here where any away game they play now where they lay an egg or get pumped by somebody, the fans who attend that game are going to feel like, wait a minute, why don't we get a refund as well? Exactly. It's, it's a slippery slope, <laughs> and I think it's ridiculous. And, and to your point, I, I get what they were trying to do, but... In, in doing so, they left themselves wide open for continued criticism, continued ridicule, and accusations of, uh, you know, being unfair or being hypocritical. And, and they open themselves up when a situation where they lose or they lose by multiple goals or they just they lose in a way that somebody subjectively feels does not live up to some sort of Spurs level. Now, <laughs> that level obviously has diminished greatly over the years, but there's still this, this belief out there that this is an acceptable form of play uh, even, even if you lose. So I just think, you know, it's just, it's dumb. It, sports in particular, I think, woven into the arrangement that you have with your customer is that these are human beings and they are they are fallible they are apt to have good and bad days and good and bad games and you accept that buyer beware if uh, if you will uh, i do think that there is there is something when it comes to player rotation and this whole thing about uh, you know the uh, the situation of how much players can play should players play when you are promoting and when you are marketing specific players then I think you get into that and we talked about this before a situation where you could be accused of false advertising but I don't think any individual team just advertises that we're going to win every single game and it's going to be the best and most beautiful <laughs> game that you have you have ever seen and i in that sense i think that's smart and you protect uh you protect yourself but i just think that was it was just dumb it was dumb and the top four in england is done newcastle and manchester and are going to finish third and fourth in some order i know liverpool have had a mini revival here they've surged up to fifth but there are too many points behind those two teams with not enough games left to play so um, yeah, Liverpool is at 33 games. Manchester United is only at 32 games. Liverpool has 56 points, and Manchester United has 63. Because there was some talk of if Liverpool wins out going through, that they could get that that Champions League spot. You think it's done and dusted? Yeah, I don't see it. You, you, you don't see it. Well, I mean, well, if that's the case, then the big surprises of the year will have been Chelsea, obviously, right now sitting in 12th and not even close to playing in, in Europe, but we've kind of known that. Um, Spurs being Spursy, so maybe that's not really that much of a surprise ultimately, and like you said, uh, Liverpool finishing out of uh, the top four. And, the, and the, I guess the big, should it be a surprise now that Newcastle has done what they have done? They're sitting in third right now, spent a lot of money, obviously new ownership and all that kind of stuff. So isn't this just proof of concept and this is ultimately what was bought and paid for and now being given? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still maintain that this is still a story of a team punching above its weight and you look at the players they've bought 
um, and, and the job that Eddie Howe's done, there's still kind of a plucky underdog feel to them, which I know is hard for some people to stomach given who the owners are, but I don't think we've entered that phase yet where who the owners are are going to become readily apparent when you look at the squad and, and, and the pedigree of the players. You know, you know what I mean? But, but isn't that even more of a reason to be bullish about Newcastle if – even without yeah, no, even I, the full force behind of what they could potentially do, absolutely. they have still already jumped up. And this is, any way that you slice it, this is a success. Absolutely, okay, yeah. Okay, right. I, I will say on Chelsea, uh, when I was looking up Arsenal's schedule and I saw they were playing Chelsea, instinctively that still registered with me as a sure, tough game. Sure. But then you take a step back and say, actually, that's probably the best game you could play right now because that team has checked out <laughs> completely on this season. I guess. <laughs> I, I, I still think that there is something that, that – that seed that has been planted and is planted in all of us for what Chelsea is. And they are certainly living off of their past. But I do think that whoever comes up against them still has this feeling that that Chelsea that everyone thought they were going to see but we haven't seen is going to show up. And it's going to show up at the worst possible point for whoever is ultimately playing on that day. Because if Chelsea, with all of the talent that they have, actually get it together and do what we all thought they were going to do – Somebody's going to be on the end of that, and that's going to be an ass whooping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Germany, uh, Dortmund stumbled on Friday. They were held to a 1 1 draw away to Eric Winalda's former club, Bochum. Gio Reyna, a late uh, second half substitute, no goal scoring heroics in this one. Uh, that opened the door for Bayern Munich, who are still not right, by the way. This was a labored victory, but nevertheless, they did pick up a 2 0 home win over last place Hertha Berlin. Serge Gnabry and Kingsley Coman with the goals. That means Bayern leapfrog Dortmund. They are now one point ahead with four to play. So plucky old Bayern is just going to stumble into the end here and uh, and find a way to just at the last minute <laughs> get the uh, get the uh, Bundesliga title. Um, when, uh, you mentioned uh, Gio coming in, so that's a that's a good thing, especially considering that he hasn't at times uh, come in recently. I, I mentioned last show that I wanted to try to figure out where Gio was going to go if he's going to go, but if if everything was perfect and he was healthy I need a little bit more time to think about this and I think as we get closer to the summer uh, I think you'd agree with me there there may be some more um, rumors out there as to what ultimately is going to happen and we I, I think we want to kind of incorporate that in so I will I will get you at some point my five destinations for for uh, for Gio but I kind of wanted to play just out a little bit more before we ultimately do that uh, what else Massey? Uh, in Italy, the champagne is still on ice. Uh, Napoli could have clinched the title this past weekend. They got the result they needed at the San Siro. Lazio suffered a 3-1 defeat away to Inter, and that meant that had Napoli beaten Salernitana at home, they would have secured their first Scudetto since a Diego Maradona-inspired triumph in 1990. Napoli led in the second half. It looked like it was going to happen, but Salernitana with a late equalizer, 1-1 final means Napoli hasn't clinched yet. It's only a matter of time. Their next chance, there's a midweek round in Italy. On Wednesday, Lazio hosts Sassuolo. If Lazio don't win that game, it's over. If Lazio do win that game, then Napoli only need a point away to Udinese on Thursday. What a buzzkill, huh, from Salernitana. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. That's Memo Ochoa's club. Right, anyway. exactly. And managed by former Flamengo boss, Paulo Sousa. Oh, my God. There we go. Uh, Flamengo, where did that, where did that team play? Where are they from? Uh, Rio de Janeiro, yeah, Brazil. That's, yeah. that's what I thought. Uh I mean, everything's set. Uh, the fireworks are ready to go. All the police are out, and they've all they got all the uh, uh, the security in place to deal with uh, at least what on the surface was going to be a party the likes of which Napoli or the world has never seen. And then, ooh. and so now something could happen midweek where they'd win it even without even stepping on the field. Correct. Boo! Just hold on to the one goal lead. <laughs> One last, last thing. I don't want to make too much of this yet, but PSG continue to screw around in Ligue 1. Their lead over Marseille is down to five points. So we'll, we'll follow that in the next coming weeks, and Sean Sullivan and, and they lost will decide. Home, right? they, they lost at home yeah. to Lorient. We'll decide if that's rundown worthy, uh, if there's any danger of them actually. I'm not worried about it. you really worried about it? I, not yet, but five points. Stop, please. All right, what else? Anything that else? is it. 
All right, that was our look around uh, Europe. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi, that part of the uh, show where you send in your questions and uh, we answer them, or your comments or your concerns, and you use that hashtag Ask Alexi or hashtag Ask Mossy. Uh, and our platform uh, handles out there are SOTU with Alexi, or you can call into our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297, 657-549-2297. I think we went old school today and went with a bunch of Twitter questions. Is that correct, Ma- Mossy? That's correct. All right, First what do we got? one from Dalton Hershorn. He asks, is it wrong for me to dislike <laughs> Jack Grealish <laughs> solely because of his hair? All right, so I, I know something about uh, soccer and hair. And one of, the, one of the things that I love about the game is the aesthetic. I, I would say that it's so much more important relative to other games. Obviously, there's not helmets or caps um and so you can you know, you can see the players uh, in soccer so much more so than you can in uh, other sports and i think the players have recognized this long recognized this and their their costume like i said their aesthetics uh, and even the recognition and the respect of the optics of how they look have long been cultivated uh, that's that's not answering your question yet, but absolutely, if you feel that the hair is the reason to li- dislike Jack Grealish, I mean he's got this. Well, first off, he's got the uh, the string. The string has, uh, for many decades now, been the go-to of many uh, to hold back the hair in order to give them the uh, sight lines that they uh, that they want. These are all characters. These are all, I believe, characters within a performance. And you have heroes and villains. You have good and bad. Um, you have angelic and you have devilish. You have all of these different things. And the way a, a player plays, the actions that a player takes, um, the way that he or she comports themselves and holds themselves, and, as I've said, the costume in which they feel most comfortable and come out all of that can play into how you feel about a player. So it's absolutely justified for you, Dalton, to dislike Jack Grealish solely because of his hair. And don't think for a second that he doesn't recognize that his look um, is something that he has cultivated and has an effect on those. Now, keep in mind, Dalton, there are plenty out there that specifically because of his hair, will watch him. Now, he's a great and incredibly talented player on the field, but it's all part of the package. And the package, I think, athletes long ago realized um, is important to, to most, not to, not to all players, but to a lot of players. Yeah, a lot of people think the Jamie Tart character in Ted Lasso is based on Grealish. Grealish, right now, more or less occupies that David Beckham place in English football. He's not as, as famous as Beckham. Mm-hmm. Whether he's as handsome as Beckham, I'll defer to our the females on our team, Kiara, Aaron, Kat, etc. They can chime in on that. Uh, but he's certainly a good-looking guy. He's dated beautiful women. And so he's he, he just signed a sponsorship deal with Gucci. So Ooh, really? Yeah. I, I, I like him. I like his personality. Anytime he does interviews, he always you know has a, a wit about him and is willing to joke. And I think we either joke about himself or joke about a situation. Uh I suppose if you're going dis- to dislike something aesthetically about him, how about those big old calves? Oh my goodness, those are huge. I mean, I don't even think that his they make socks that are able to contain the calves, which is why he has to wear them down kind of around his ankles in an old school style. But purely from a soccer perspective, Mossy, keep in mind that when he came to, to Man City, he didn't start right away. He certainly, for all the money and all the hype, didn't quite live up to it, but He's getting a consistency right now, and I think he's playing his best soccer that we have seen, regardless of his hair uh, or his, uh, the way that he looks. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, last season, he did not come close to justifying that price tag they paid Aston Villa for him, but this season, he's been very, very good. Yeah. I'll just finish it up here when it comes uh, to hair. And, you know, obviously, the, the way that I looked back in the day, and, you know, I was next to Marcelo ba- Balboa, yeah, we cared a lot about hair back then. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've said before that the amount of uh, hair care products that me and my generation, because long hair isn't as in, notwithstanding Erlen Holland, 
But long hair isn't as in now as it was back in the 80s and 90s when I was uh, running around. And, you know, the amount of hair care products and the hot oil treatments and the, the scrunchies that I, that I had rivaled even, you know, my girlfriend's at the, uh, at the time. I was, I was much more concerned at times with my hair than <laughs> girls that I was hanging around with so that's uh, you know that's the way it works out but hair has been and continues to be a focus when it comes to the game and it's something that I love about the game what else Masi? next up Ali Vernia asks do you think a cap on payroll is coming to soccer worldwide will this lead to MLS being able to keep talent players won't have to leave to get paid if it's equal across the board all right so uh, you know this is a, a, a question relative to Know, what amounts to a a salary cap, and he, you know, he, I, I think that uh, you know you're talking about it worldwide, but I think it's it's useful to kind of look at it as to the potential of it coming to um, to Europe. And uh, Seferin, uh, the head of UEFA, in a recent interview, I think with uh, our friends over there at Men and Blazers, actually brought up the subject and said that this is something that they are absolutely examining and something that they would. Um, they would consider and something that is a potential in the future. Now, it's easy to say that, but I think it's very, very difficult. And I, I, I said this on Twitter earlier. I think it's very difficult to put that, you know, or to get that train back in the station. That that train left a long time ago in terms of wide open and it's not that there aren't restraints and restrictions, but relative to the salary cap that we kind of know from an American perspective, which obviously limits spending, but also manufactures parity and competition, something that most of the leagues that don't have that don't have. They're very top heavy. And so that's one of the arguments for and one of the reasons why it possibly could be implemented. And there's those that argue that that would make the league's that much more interesting where it's not top heavy and the ones that spend and are allowed to spend so much more ultimately are the ones that win and then there's uh, there's everybody else but if you're a player if you are an agent if you are a player rep a union rep a association rep why would you ever want to limit the amount of money that could be spent on players and so I think that's the big question and they can come at it from an existential perspective when i say they i mean the ownership and uefa they can come at it and say in order for us to exist going forward and to you know do we need some fiscal responsibility going forward but i think that's a real hard sell uh for uh, for owners it's kind of the pro rel issue in reverse something that's intrinsic to our sporting culture but completely foreign to theirs yeah yeah exactly so i there might be versions of it in the same way that we have the financial fair play situation where there might be something, give it a name, whatever the name is, that on the surface is designed to show that they are doing things to increase that manufactured parity and provide a more competitive balance. But in practice, it probably is not going to change a whole lot. And ultimately, when you're the players, or like I said, the representatives of players, all you care about is, I want to make the most amount of money that I possibly can. And any restriction is not something that I'm going to support. And then uh, final tweet at KC Sock Wiz. Uh, Sporting KC is 03 and 7. How long before Peter Vermes is fired asking for a friend? Yeah, we mentioned that at the top. They lost 2-0 uh, to Montreal this past weekend. So, yeah, it's no wins, three points, and just three goals in the first 10 games of the season on pace to be – the worst team in MLS history. Yeah, I mean, th it, this is a complete disaster right now for Sporting KC. I think that Peter Vermes has been given every benefit of the doubt, as I, th I think you would expect him to be, given his legendary status and what he has built. But everything comes to an end. You know, this does get into the, the question of big clubs, elite clubs. And even with the manufactured parity of MLS, there are still clubs that are different. And for, so, for example, the Los Angeles Galaxy, all right, has since day one been positioned and sold and marketed as a big club, as a super club. Well, if you are really a super club and a big, super, uh, big club, any other big club out there, any other elite 
club out there, any other super club out there, would long ago have fired Greg Vanny. I mean, that it has lasted this long is actually an argument against LA Galaxy being a super club anymore. When it comes to Sporting KC, the way that they have positioned themselves is almost diametrically opposed to that super club in terms of what they have done. And a lot of it is just natural being in Kansas City as opposed to Los, Los Angeles. But even a, and it's not, a, it's not necessarily, because that's a, that's, not, that's a negative way to say a smaller club. But what Sporting KC is, I think people are more apt to give Sporty KC the benefit of the doubt of giving a coach like Peter Vermes the benefit of the doubt, the doubt because they are Sporting KC. But this has gotten to the point where you need to change something. And you actually have a way to change it that is the softest of landings <laughs> in terms of separating them out, them out and putting Peter Vermes in a technical director type of position, sporting director, whatever you want to call it, and then actually having a coach. But you may recognize that this is just the end of an era, and you want a clean s s uh, slate for whoever ultimately, uh, ultimately comes in. So for the ownership of Sporting KC, they have to decide going forward, do, first, do you want Peter Vermes to be part of Sporting KC going forward? If you do, in what capacity? Because right now, in his coaching capacity, it's not working. And any place else, you, you would be fired. But that's, uh, that's not happening. And look, Peter Vermes, I have all sorts of time for him as a human being and as a coach. But I, I, everything that he's tried right now, and I'm sure if Peter were here, he'd say, but this, 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 as every single coach would do that. It doesn't matter. You're there to win games. And you're not doing that. And I know you have multiple parts of your job, but as a coach right now, Peter Vermes, you have failed. And that's a, a good way to end it there because I think we're going to talk about failure here in a second. That's it. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I will give you my one for the road, which, as I said, focuses in on what is failure and what isn't failure. Don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back. It's the end of our show, and at the end of each and every show, I give you my one for the road. We've been teasing it all, all show here. Um, it has to do with, uh, with failure. Um, you know this guy uh, Giannis, right? Yep. Gianni, uh, fellow Greek, incredible NBA star, right? I mean, that's uh, to, to call him a star is, is not putting, Absolutely, it's phenomenal. Arguably the biggest talent in the NBA and could go down when all is said and done as one of the great players ever to play the game. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's got all the uh, awards there and stuff like that. Well, um, which team does he play for again? Milwaukee Bucks. The Milwaukee Bucks. He won a championship with the Bucks, evidently, uh, if uh, Wikipedia is to be believed, Correct. a couple years ago. But this season they got knocked out by the Miami Heat in the first round. Got it. But he's you know all-star okay. and uh, MVP of the league, MVP of the finals, all these diff uh, different things. So in 2023... One of the biggest stars in the uh, in the N NBA. Wonderful story. Um, Nigerian parents growing up in Greece uh, and then coming over to uh, the NBA. Uh, English is his uh, uh, a second language, and like any player, at the end of a game, and uh, this was the end of his season because he was knocked out. Uh, him and his team, he was asked different questions. And he was asked uh, the question by, I think his name's Eric ne uh, Neem uh, from The Athletic, beat writer for The Athletic for the NBA. A very simple question. Do you view this season as a failure? And this set off all sorts of uh, rockets when it comes to media as to, first off, was this an appropriate question? Let's, let's get to that first. This was absolutely an appropriate question, given the stature of the player, given the recent success that the player and the team have had. And look, I, I, in no way do I claim to be an NBA a, uh, expert, but it takes two seconds to figure out that this was uh, an appropriate question. His answer was actually very, very interesting and nuanced and I guess it, given the stereotype of athletes, 
I guess it sh I shouldn't be surprised that people were people were so amazed and surprised at uh, this athlete providing a nuanced and a um, incredibly uh, reflective and detailed and articulate uh, and clear, concise answer to what on the surface is a simple question. And he, while he said a bunch of things, ultimately it comes down to, quote, there are no failures in sports. There's good days, bad days. Some days you are able to be successful. Some days you are not. Some days it is your turn. Some days it's not. That's what sports is about. You don't always win. Now, embedded in all of his answer was, and if you watched it, was an obvious exasperation on his part and a frustration at certainly losing. And, you know, you just come off losing, but more so that this was a question and that how dare this reporter ask this type of question and that he, I'm assuming it's Eric's a he over there, uh, doesn't and can't ever understand. And so he was trying to make somebody understand. I get it. I get what he is saying. But as I said, this is a completely justifiable uh, question and gets to the core of what athletes, and in this case, elite athletes are about. And certainly you can make a long, passionate type of response to this, talking about all of the successes that you have had that you can view, some that the public can view and some that you maybe can only view in sports. And this applies to all sports. This isn't just about basketball. This resonates to all sports. And I think this resonates to all athletes. Athletes can be triggered just like anybody else. And the word failure, it is at times weaponized. <laughs> and it has baggage with it. And it's almost a cutting type of word to an athlete to either be accused of or to recognize th that you have failed. But unless your goal was to finish second, <laughs> then yes, it's okay to say that you have failed. Was your season a failure? Did you get up when you started the season and say, I wanna finish second? I don't think you did. And again, we're talking about a player that has been the MVP, that has led his team very recently to NBA uh, final championship titles. And so it's not out of the realm of p possibility. It's one thing if the U.S. men's national team says, we want to win the World Cup, okay? Something that they have never done and have never even been close to doing. It's another thing if Giannis says, I want to win an NBA championship. And having done that very, very recently, and certainly having the talent individually and collectively to be able to do that and then not doing that, then it's okay. It's a failure. Does it make you any less of a player? And it, it, he wasn't screaming and yelling. It was actually a very emotional and passionate type of response. And as I said, nuanced in the way that he talked and actually a, an interesting glimpse into how he views, he views sports. But I think it also plays into this whole Everybody gets a trophy, and it doesn't matter whether you win. No, this is professional sports. This is your job, something that you are paid millions and millions of dollars to do. And so you can certainly not feel that it was a failure. And that's the answer to Eric's question here was obviously no. I don't feel it as a failure. And these are the reasons why of all the different successes that we have had uh, we have had in there but make no mistake about it this was a failure and look uh i even saw shaquille o'neal this is how much this resonated first off that i even heard about this like i don't follow basketball that shows you how much this permeated into the culture sports culture and beyond Sha you know shaquille o'neal talked about i want to win a championship and if I don't win a championship, given who Shaquille O'Neal is, given the team that he played for, it's a failure. And he didn't look at it as I'm a bad person or that I should be 
embarrassed or ashamed of all of the work that went in. But if this isn't about winning, then what the hell are we doing here? And I think that that ultimately is where the greats are. And so I'm not saying that this, you know, that Giannis isn't a great or can't be a great. And look, right after you lose, you're emotional about things. But I, I also don't think that taking to task a reporter for asking the question uh, is, uh, is right. You failed. You get up next year, and unless, it's, unless just your goal is to get to the playoffs or just to score more points or something like that, then it's okay. It's all right. You're, you're going to go down as one of the great NBA players ever. And in this season, it was a failure because your goal, I'm assuming, was to win the title. And you didn't. And yes, another 20-some teams also didn't achieve that goal if that goal at the beginning of the season was to win uh, the championship. Did uh, Steph Curry's performance uh, catch your attention? This no idea season? who he even plays for. Uh, who does, he, who does he play for? Warriors. He dropped 50 in a game seven. It was a transcendent performance. The NBA playoffs. That would be a success hot, as right opposed now. to a yes, failure, right? Yes. Uh, had, he, had he only scored 49 and they lost? <laughs> if he had said, my goal is to score 50 points, and he didn't score 50 points, that would have been a failure. Eastern Conference, we've got Knicks, Heat, Celtics, Sixers, and then Western Conference, Warriors, Lakers, uh, Curry versus LeBron, and uh, Nuggets, Suns. Uh, four tremendous series. Incidentally, I'm going to be in New York mid-May. That's right, you were And I us. have uh, purchased the ticket for Knicks Heat Game 7. So if that series goes to seven games, I will be at MSG. But they've already lost one, you told me. They lost Game 1 at home, so I'm a little worried right, now. But so you need it to go to seven. Yeah. So well, I'd, I'd rather the Knicks win it in fewer than seven. I would put my fandom above going to that really? game. Really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 if you have tickets for Game 7, don't you want it to go seven? Well, they might lose games. So okay, well, that would well yeah, but still you being there, that's well. the most important thing. It's about you, Mossy. It's not about uh, your team. Incidentally, Sean Sullivan, what are we at time-wise? <laughs> He's Sean Sullivan has had this dream since he started producing his <laughs> podcast of having a sub one hour pod. It's like the four minute mile to him. Right. And every time we seem to be on track for it, you, when we get later on the pod, you sometimes go on these long meandering <laughs> uh, monologues. <laughs> and uh, I think we're right on the bubble right now. So we need to wrap this up. All right. We do have to wrap it up. Uh, I have to actually uh, start uh, doing some uh, team previews of the uh, Women's World Cup. So those will be out uh, going forward here. Some real quick snippets uh if you will about what to watch for when it comes to the women's world cup because it, it is it is coming fast and furious thank you uh for listening uh for all of the 59 minutes or 60 minutes whatever this ends up being uh and reviewing and rating and downloading and subscribing and doing all the different things that uh, you do you make this show what it is and we couldn't be more happy to uh, be a part of it and thankful that we have so many people out there including uh our friend uh, bruno and uh the rally mullet over there who uh, again over there from caretti's pizza in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, sending us hats. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you to you and everybody else out there that, uh, uh, that listens and watches the pod. We'll talk to you again later on this week. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the day.